I discovered Joel B. New a few years ago when I came across his podcast, Something New, and I binged that podcast. I highly recommend it for you if you're looking for something to listen to during these times of quarantine. Look into Something New, which is a podcast where he features a brand new song every podcast. More amazing knowing that the podcast came out every week. So not only was he putting out a podcast every week, he was putting out a brand new song every week. He's had tons of accolades for much of his work. He's won awards. He has produced and produced and produced his own work, which I always encourage young playwrights and composers to do. But he's starting to get some real attention. And in Broadway world, they gushed over his brand new musical, Monkey Trouble Unleashed. Joel was so gracious to have an online conversation with me that I recorded on Skype. I hope you will enjoy listening to stories from his life and his creative process. I really am looking forward to knowing what you think of the revamped Sally Pal now on YouTube. Thanks for watching. I look forward to talking with you more in the comment section. <laughs> Joel B. New, thank you so much for joining me on Sally Pal. My pleasure, Sally. Happy to be here. I'm from Oklahoma, which yes, you're not from Oklahoma, but you have been in Oklahoma. Lived yes, in Oklahoma. yes. I got my uh, Bachelor of Music in Musical Theater at Oklahoma City University. Same place as Kristen Chenoweth. Yes, yeah. She yeah. was a big draw. Like she had oh, like cool. just won the Tony or something like that. So okay. I'm loving your wallpaper. I should mention that I am featuring your <laughs> latest work behind me. Actually, not your latest work because I happen to know you're working on something new. But I, uh, I binge listened to your podcast a few years ago. And I what? listened hours at a time. I loved it that you interviewed people who were doing work in the theater, but also were like a Pilates instructor. And at the end of podcasts, you would do a live concert. Brand new song every episode. Joel, you're amazing. And Sally Pal is about talking to artists who are creating original work for the stage or for a live audience. For now, your live audience is out here. I want you to talk about your creation of the last live audience work you did, Songs I Can Do If I Practice. <laughs> yeah. We're all in our own little isolated bubbles. The arts is something that sees a lot of people through, including myself. And usually on or around my birthday, I'll do something. I'll do some kind of performance, something to kind of like mark the passing of time, but also to celebrate like moving forward in my art and in life. And I did not want this birthday to go unmarked because of the situation. So a week before I just announced, I was like, I'm going to do a live stream concert on YouTube. Uh, it's going to be songs from from the past and I'm going to talk about them and give you some banter and it also lit a fire under me to like be performance ready or ready to like present new stuff from like new projects as well so it was a it was a nice walk down memory lane which I don't do that often because I'm always just trying to move forward and you gave yourself a week to prepare yep yep I practiced for a week because <laughs> I don't really I'm blessed that I have friends who music direct professionally and make my music sound so much better than I could at the piano because I kind of like play like this, <laughs> especially as I'm performing. So I needed to practice if I was actually going to present my work in any kind of entertaining way. Guitar, I hadn't picked up the guitar in over a year. My favorite view from the city is from far, far away. I just love it. It's so pretty. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have heard several versions of that song, all of them quite brilliant. I didn't hear the version yet that I wanted to until I watched your show. There's a nuance that you bring to the song that I haven't seen yet. Intimacy of how you did that song, it made me cry. It really did. Oh, it's thank you. Thank you. It makes, I'm, I'm welling up right now. It's a very personal song and I believe in giving performers permission, especially in a concert or cabaret situation, the artistic freedom to move that song in the way that's going to fit them and tell their story the best way possible. And I also, I try not to over explain those types of songs that I've written to my performance as we're rehearsing, because I don't want to like put all this like weight on top of their shoulders and be like, I'm going to be sitting there thinking about 
my mom. And like, I don't, I kind of share the backstory of like how the song was built after the fact, because I'm trying to do them a service by letting them uh, serve the song as they want. Well, I think that's incredibly generous. And that really does come through in your style. I applaud you. Do you bring something different to it every time? Or do you always bring the original story? You'll have to say now what it is. Yeah, so um, I lost my mom very unexpectedly in 2012, and my first birthday uh, without her physically on the earth, uh, my sister gifted me my mom's old guitar from when she was a teenager, and like had it restrung. I'm a lefty, and mom was a righty, so I started to take guitar lessons. And um, the first song I wrote on any guitar was my mom's guitar, and I wrote "Beautiful Sleeping Giant." The the song is you know has several layers in it to me anyway and and one is just like all of that like parental maternal imagery and like uh, fairy tales and giants and you know the city that never sleeps and a friend had also given me like the song assignment of write a love song to new york and i was like i don't know if i can do that it's like <laughs> it's i i think we all have you know anyone who's lived here for as long as i have like you have a you have a love hate relationship with it and you hate to love it and you love to hate it and um, that song was like my push and pull with uh, my relationship with um, the city and, um, and my own identity with it. When I perform it now, because it has, you know, the song has been around for going on, I guess, seven, eight years. You know, I just, I carry that with me in, the, in, in my center, but I, I carry those seven, eight years as well. And my relationship with, the city, it's a very different place right now, for sure, during the lockdown. So like, you're thinking about that and thinking about like, I haven't seen the city, like I live in Queens. And so like, I haven't seen a view of the city in probably two months, you know, so like, that's where my heart's leaning right now. For my birthday, a couple of friends ordered me some wine that was delivered, and that was a very lovely gesture. So that brings me to since you are at home, this is the time of COVID. I want to know something about the thing right behind me, you're in process of revamping this show and you got an amazing review in Broadway World. I was just- I know. Wasn't that nice? Oh my gosh. They were gaga over it. Yeah, they, it was It was a very, very flattering, generous review, yeah. How is it to be marketing one show and revising it at the same time that you're in first draft on another show, which is The Undertaker's Christmas? Undertaking Christmas. <laughs> Undertaking Christmas. <laughs> For me, it's important that there's always more than one project being worked on at once. Because like, if you get stuck on show A, then you can go over to show B. Hopefully, like one is a little further along in like your own personal development process. The quarantine has like helped that immensely. Like that's been one of the silver linings. Like I, I'm like a month ahead of like my own set schedule as like as far as like how quickly I was going to write the show. Um, well, because you started it, I think you said you started it in February? Yeah, like I just, and I booked a venue in February for December to, to premiere the show. <laughs> well, that'll get you going. <laughs> that's what I do. You got to. It's the duplex here in New York, and like that's where Monkey Trouble Unleashed premiered in concert, and like I've done several concerts and appeared in other people's concerts in that venue like I love them so much as a creative you've come up with some strategies that will motivate you to keep working I, I remember there's a song you wrote called focus I think is that the name yeah of it? yeah yeah and it has to do with focusing on creative work and how hard it is any of us who work in creative fields totally get that are there other things that you do to keep yourself working on it and keep yourself in the authentic range of creating rather than, well, I've got to put something down. Sometimes something down is better than nothing down. And you have to give yourself permission to write the wrong thing first. Imploring your friends who are performers to come over or like we rent a rehearsal studio and like we'll work on a song or something like that. Like that's something that my podcast, Something New, was so helpful with because there was a guest coming and there was that deadline, that expectation, like someone's coming over to sing something so <laughs> yeah. you better have something well tell me a little bit about developing this show because it is a it's a mashup of two of your favorite movies 
<laughs> yeah. There's all this really weird stuff in your shows. Where is that coming from? I call Monkey Trouble Unleashed my fuck it show because I've I've been around for a while and I've written a lot of shows that feel more or less like traditional book musicals. There was just kind of like a like a threshold or a breaking point. Am I doing what I want to be doing? Am I am I surrounded by the people that I want to have in my life? Am I am I making the things that matter to me and like resonate with me. So for me, you know, I just sort of just lean in aggressively on the pieces of pop culture that really resonated with me. Then like that started with my Murder She Wrote album, Cabot Cove. I own that. Thank oh, you very Cabot. much. Yeah, that we we did a Kickstarter and I can't believe that came out in December twenty sixteen. Like that's crazy. You've been so incredibly productive since then. It surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> For uh, Monkey Trouble Unleashed, the two movies were a Jet Li movie and another movie called Monkey Trouble. Is that right? Monkey Trouble, yeah. Monkey Trouble is like a family film from like the early 90s that me and my sister like watched the video cassette like to death. In 2001, this movie Unleashed came out starring Jet Li. I think it was directed by... Luc Besson, who had done The Fifth Element, which is like one of my favorite movies. Oh. So I was like, I was like, I was like, whatever Unleashed is, I'm in. So I watched it and I was like, this is the same plot as Monkey Trouble. It was so weird how perfectly those two lined up. And I kind of like put a pin in it in like 2001 and was like, I have to do something with this. Yeah. Many years later, I started to like pitch it to different like writing residencies and submitting it to things just like as an idea. It got rejected. No one else saw what I saw. The tone of the book should be stupid. I should have so much fun writing the show that people can't help but have fun themselves when they see it. It did not write itself for sure, but it was really fun to write and felt easier. Is Move the Body from this show? Help Me Move This Body. Help Me Move This Body. I feel like it's a quintessentially Joel B. New song. Because you've taken this idea of moving a dead body mm -hmm. and then turned it into the sort of this disco number. It's like a club. About moving your body. Yes. And it's very sexy. And I just love it. Because you've taken two disparate ideas. It's very Shakespearean of you. And made them both elegantly work together. Thank you. That is the first time I've been compared to Shakespeare. My oh, goodness. My dear, just own it. Why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Help me move this body. That was that was a late song in the show, kind of like an 11 o'clock number for this subsidiary character who in the show's current form, like it's her only number. When I was writing the dialogue, I got to the line where she says, well, don't just stand there. Help me move this body. Well, crap. That's the hook. And like, <laughs> how could you not? And because like, how could you not? And because like you got you have you do have that like double entendre of like help me move this corpse and like help me help me move my own body. We kind of needed that moment. Not that the show needed any additional levity, but it but, but it needed kind of like a break from from the plot. You know, the older I get, the more I make peace with those moments where I'm like, well, is this moving the story forward? No. Is it entertaining? Yes. Can we afford a moment where we're just being entertained? Yes. Great. And then move forward and find out what that is. And then like the disco thing just came later as like I was working with uh, my friend Charles and um, that groove just felt more natural. I was like, I was, I was like, I think this is what that is. A lot of people who haven't done <clears throat> as much work as you've done will sometimes think it all happens at once. Like, mm. boom idea is there and, and it's fully formed like Venus. And in fact, it's an evolutionary process. Very rarely will the first draft be the last draft. That does happen. But if you tell yourself that that is the expectation, you're going to limit yourself and you're going to get bogged down in like your own self-doubt and you're not going to produce nearly as much as you could. I decided for my next project just to continue on my train of writing about subject matters that like I love. I love Christmas. Like I celebrate Christmas. I love Christmas. I love all of the cheesy commercialism. Like I just, I embrace it all. And one of my favorite things is like cheesy Hallmark holiday movies. It's the comfort food of cinema. It's just like total unapologetic, like feel goodery. You know what's happening in the plot. It's a grilled cheese sandwich so you, with potato soup. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I'm hungry. That was my impetus to write Undertaking Christmas, an amalgam of all of those like Hallmark type movie tropes, of which there are many. And just I put I threw in as many of those as I could. Um, not to make fun of it, but really just like lift it up. And I took other things that I'm interested in. One continues to be laughing at death. And the other one is putting queer characters in the center of the story and not making a big deal about it. You have created this show that's a comfort food, I guess, of creative writing is also at a time when that's probably exactly what we need. I just need to feel good right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's a terrible, happy accident that that's what I'm working on right now. But I'm grateful because like it has been my comfort food as I as I work on it. And is this the one that you scheduled for December? I think it's December 6th at the duplex. And yeah, that'll be the first time it'll be heard in its entirety. So I did a table read of the first act pretty much like like book only. One thing that like this quarantine has done is like brought us all so much closer together and has like presented these opportunities to collaborate across state lines, across oceans. The way you share your work is so generous. You're allowing us to hear it being sung by so many different kinds of voices. And you have a community there that's also getting an opportunity to sing new work. There's a lot of joy and generosity in like the community that that I'm a part of. I love working with artists that I trust. God bless people who can just like riff and feel the harmonies and like find some other note and that makes it better. Did anybody give you a great piece of advice that you've held onto or would you give a piece of advice based on your experience to someone who's following in your footsteps? One piece of advice I got early on was write music that you'd actually want to listen to. When you're feeling all this faceless, voiceless pressure of like, you know, oh, you want to write musicals, like you should sound like this and like all those shoulds that are always going to like be the death of you. No, what do you actually like to listen to? And what does that sound like coming through you? Because like, it's always going to be filtered through your point of view. One thing that I've learned in the last couple of years, like after writing Monkey Trouble Unleashed was that there's power in comedy. I never really dug into let's write like a show that is funny because that's a really scary task comedy's hard someone came to the monkey trouble unleashed concert and told a friend i really needed that today that is payment in full there's power in comedy there's po power in laughter set those deadlines for yourself no one is going to make you show up but you and find what makes you weird <laughs> weird is a very empowering word and an important one it's not Find what makes your voice unique, I feel like it's like a non-starter. It's, it's like, okay, but like find what makes you weird. And like your weird should look and sound completely different than anyone else's. Lean into that stuff unapologetically and make the stuff that turns you on. To quote the musical title of show, I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing. You're my favorite thing. So thank you so much. Thank I, you. I mean, I've been following you for a while. I have to ask you, who is your favorite Disney villain? My favorite Disney villain? Mine's Ursula, by the way. Good, good one. I've been telling myself I would interview you one of these days, so I'm thrilled that you were so willing to jump on. I'm extremely flattered. Have you thought of your villain? Oh, it's a tie between Ursula and Maleficent. Maleficent's good. There's Cruella, too. Yeah, just those women who just, like have like that gravitas in their voice and in their presence and just like own everything, you right. know? And like, I love writing villains. I loved writing Bart in Monkey Trouble Unleashed for Amy Jo Jackson, who's just like a tour de force. And like, surround yourself by tour de forces. That's another piece of advice. Surround yourself with geniuses, generous geniuses. <laughs> That's very wise. The new villain from Undertaking Christmas, his villain song, Backroll Cole, which is about like being bullied when you were younger. And then it's kind of a cautionary tale. And Yeah, don't bully the fat kid. Do not bully the fat kid. It'll turn into your nope. worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with me. I know you got a lot of work going on. Sally, it was my pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. And thank you for creating these conversations and opportunities uh, for artists to 
to uh, to reach their audiences. <laughs> Bye.